Hello and welcome to um, another of our lockdown live stream interviews from our Glasgow Loves EU group. Um, I'm Jenny Wilson and tonight I'd like to introduce Paolo Arigio from Seeds of Italy. Hi, ciao I should say. <laughs> Hello there and we've also got helping us tonight we've got Bernd who's from our group doing our, the technical stuff and Jenny who's going to be covering the social media. Um, Hi questions so um, if you think of any questions or comments as you're listening in please send them in on Facebook or Twitter and we'll keep an eye and try and, and try and bring some of these comments um, to Paolo. So um, just before I start just to say about our group we're, we're uh, apolitical we're, we're from uh, various political parties plus no political parties and obviously we've been campaigning pro-EU campaigning but now we're, we're campaigning to get a good future relationship with the EU and we've during the lockdown been looking at all aspects of you know what type of deal can we get and, and what's going to be best for different industries in Britain so it's great to be able to talk specifically about seeds tonight with Paolo um, and so just to introduce Paolo and I had originally seen him actually on the Chelsea Flower Show program so um, that was um, I've been following him on social media um, he was voted the slow food well, Slow Food UK Person of the Year 2019. I, I, I won't be able to get out of the door tonight if you uh, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> he was a mem he's a member of the Guild of Food Writers. He's a multiple Royal Horti Horticulture Society medal winner, biodiversity campaigner, author, Absolutely. and public speaker. And it's quite timely this week that we're talking about this because it's actually been harvest day, harvest day this week. So really important time of year and a, a sort of forgotten about but very important area. So tonight, um, your Seeds of Italy campaign, could you just give us some background about how you got into the seed business? Yeah, so like uh, like a good London Italian, and can I say Glasgow as well? I mean, how many, you know, that lovely Italian culture that you've got in, in, in Glasgow as well, many, many, and Edinburgh, and I can, I can think of, of many places. And of course, the Italians, when they went somewhere, they brought their culture with them. And, and this is the thing I really, really love. I think that, you know, I'm very, one is my country and the other is my culture. And you can be proud of both. You know, my son serves. So all of those people who say, oh, well, you know, you, you support the EU, will say, well, well, my son serves, you know. And, and so I'm very proud of that, you know, Royal Army Medical Corps. So um, how did I start Seeds of Italy? Um, I, I was brought up in, in my dad's deli. And so I was brought up the Italian way. And that is in the garden, in the kitchen and at the table. I'll tell you a very quick um, story. When I was 13 or 14, I played truant from school. There was a, a, a class that I didn't like very much. I was a very naughty boy and I went off to the woods. I just didn't want to do this class. And whilst I was in the woods, it was October, I found two porcini mushrooms. And so I had this conflict now. And so what did I do? I went home, but I bought the mushrooms with me. And so, of course, you don't go to school and come home with porcini mushrooms. And so I was rumbled. And this is the beauty of an Italian household. On the one hand, I got a hiding that I will never forget. But on the other hand, we had um, porcini risotto for dinner. And uh, I know that my dad was very, very proud of me deep down, not for playing the truant, but because of the thing that I did was very Italian. So I've always had this culture of this food culture sort of in me. And when my dad had the deli, I just thought it'd be really cool to have some Italian veg seeds. Because every time I went to Italy, people would say to me, get me some Neapolitan tomato seed or get me some rocket. You could not buy rocket seed in this country uh, 15 years ago. It just, you just could not find it. And, um, and other things, you know, uh, uh, some Ligurian basil, whatever. And I, I just thought, wouldn't it be really cool to have a seed stand of Italian seeds in our deli? It would be the only place in the UK with one because nobody imports them. So I literally went to the tin in my greenhouse and I looked inside and I had 12 or 13 different packets of seed, but only two Two of them had English on and I didn't like the other packet because the picture was glued on and so unwittingly I ended up dealing with Frankie who the oldest family run seed um, company on the planet and um, but but better than that is the varieties that they do are not mass produced corporate varieties they're endangered their heritage and their regional local varieties and so this is where it really becomes interesting when you're looking at uh, seeds and brexit but you know that's how i started it, it was it was it's a pure passion for food 
and food come from seed. And one thing that people did not talk about during the advisory referendum was seeds, except me. I've been banging on about seeds for four and a half years. And yet everything you eat directly or indirectly comes from seed, even milk, if you want to put it like that, because the cow came from seed and actually the grass and the foods that it eat come from seed. We come from seed. And, you know, literally your burger bun from, you know, your, your burger place, the, the gherkin inside it, the tomato inside it, the meat inside it, the mayonnaise, everything, the oil, everything comes from seed ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and the It's the biggest thing yeah. that people never speak about. Yeah. And the access to seeds, is, it's when they run out that it becomes newsworthy, finally. Yeah. Well, well it's very interesting because what happened this year was that um, during lockdown, so so when, when were we hit with lockdown? It was March, April and May, uh, which is spring. So all the garden centres closed down and we were left in a situation where people found themselves at home. Maybe they have, have had kids. And don't forget, we're very lucky in the UK because we have gardens backyards um not so much balconies I, I i think the europeans do balconies better but you know if you compare milan to london um there's so many more green spaces and of course we have allotments and and an allotment is actually the size of an allotment is actually a roman measurement it's that a plot a roman uh, uh, an allotment plot is a hangover from 2000 years ago and the, and the same roman measurement is used to measure an allotment as it is today and so you don't kind of get allotments so much in 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 some other european it depends where you go and so we've got this great vegetable growing culture in the uk it's absolutely fantastic and um and so people found themselves locked down and the seed uh companies were just overwhelmed by a tsunami of orders uh, so on the one hand we weren't supplying the garden centers but on the other hand we were supplying uh, people and so it caused a, a real massive over demand and the seeds uh, industry nearly collapsed I mean it was under so much pressure um, but you know I like to think that at least three positive things that, that might come out of COVID is people baking people cooking from scratch and people growing vegetables because actually growing vegetables there's no downside it's great for the environment it's great for you it's great for the bees um but this is where it starts to be get, to get interesting because um there's there's two types of seed if you like there's sort of mass produced corporate varieties and then there's specialist varieties very much like the food industry you know you can get cheddar from cheddar and that's the real stuff. You know, you can get, you can get uh, Cornish pasties from Cornwall, which, of course, are, are actually protected by the EU PFN scheme, the protected food name scheme. And so what was happening before is that things like Cornish pasties and pork pies, Mel Melton Mowbray pork pies, for example, were being churned out in you know all over the uk mass produced nothing like the artisan regional products which the, the Cornish are rightly proud of and the Melton Mowbray are, are rightly proud of, etc. And, and you can talk about haggis, you can talk about so many different things. And, um, and unfortunately, this is one of the schemes that we're, we're, we're going to be losing. But what it meant was that you can't call your product a Cornish pasty unless it's made in Cornwall. And it actually, this EU law actually protected jobs you know that the ingredients inside had to be produced locally to local recipes. So local veg growers, you know, had their, had their, job saved so what we're talking about is, is is provenance and regionality and it's exactly the same with seeds because i don't know if you know but at the moment um all the seeds that you buy in the uk are either british and so they don't need to be on the eu seed list or they are from the eu and they need to be on the eu seed list who invented the uh, seed list the british and why did they invent it because in Victorian times, you might buy um, sweet corn, uh, a golden bantam. So it's a variety that we still sell. It's a heritage variety. But the seedsmen, some of them were very unscrupulous. They might sell you uh, a different variety. Well, they'll sell you golden bantam, but they give you a different variety. And what was happening is British farmers were going bust because what they were growing was substandard. It failed. And so the idea of having a seed list was a, a protection for you, the consumer. So um, it guaranteed that the description and the name 
equaled the final product. And if it didn't, it meant that you had a, a recourse, you know, you could sue or you, you, you know, you had a legal recourse. And so from that, the EU took that and, and made an EU seed list. So all the whole seed industry is very um, positive about having a seed list. The problem is that uh, with Brexit, the EU seed list will no longer be valid. And so there's a Brexit seed list, a UK seed list. And the problem with that is that not all the varieties, the specialist varieties, because only the big companies were invited um, on the, con the uh, consultancy. And so they uploaded all their mass produced corporate varieties. Gardener's delight. Moneymaker tomatoes, Shirley, Alicante, you know, all of, the, all of these uh, corporate varieties. But because all of the specialist seed companies uh, weren't invited, we find ourselves in a situation where we, we might lose a lot of these specialist varieties or they won't be available for sale. So very much like the chicken, you know, the chlorinated chicken uh, from America or the hormone fed beef, what we face is like British farmers, if they're going to be undercut by these, these inferior products, they're going to go bust, they're going to struggle. Um, it's exactly the same for seeds. And, and, and I just want to show you a, a, an, an example because it's, it's very, very interesting. People don't think about seeds. So spinach. Okay. Um, this is a, is a spinach. It's called Viraflay. Um, it dates back to 1635. We know that because it's in a book um, uh, uh, with the name and it, it was registered. And so the problem is that it's, it's endangered. And, and we know it's endangered because it's on the slow food um, uh, arc of taste, which is a, a list of endangered varieties. And slow food, if you don't know them, are the largest food movement on the planet. They're bigger than Oxfam in size. Uh, they're really, really worth uh, looking up. So we know that this variety is endangered. There are only two producers. And if those producers pop their clogs, you know, or stop producing it, then this variety is, is lost forever. So what? There's lots of other spinaches. The problem is that in the last century alone, we've lost 94% of all the heritage vegetables on the planet. Think about that, 94%. Mm. So I was telling this story to a 12 year old on our garden at Hampton Court. And she thought about it for a second and she said, but don't medicines come from plants? And it was like, bang, the 12 year old gets it. The 12 year old not only got it, but she explained biodiversity back to me better than I had explained it to her. And if there's two, one thing I've learned um, uh, 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 in the last four years is the kids are really switched on about the environment and about Brexit. They really, really are engaged with it, you know? And so that's a good thing. So by the, the problem is that this variety isn't on the new seed list. And so it, it means that we can't sell it in theory. Um, as it happens, the new British seed list won't be up and running for two years after transition ends. So actually, the entire seed industry for the next two years will be selling varieties in a, in a very grey area, should we put it like that? So, so we, we, we're all, we've all been advised uh, by DEFRA to continue um, uh, honouring the EU list. But actually, in reality it's not taking back control at all because we, we, we can, you know, we have a lot of flexibility with that yeah. list until and, and the new some, list comes in. Like an unscrupulous trader could maybe come in as well. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you get those on eBay. You, you get a lot of unscrupulous oh, yeah. traders on eBay yeah. and, and DEFRA and, uh, are always trying right. to, to crack down on them. So, yeah. so what it means is, in reality, is that a lot of these specialist varieties and, the, and there's, um, are under risk because... Because they're not on the seed list, um, the official ruling is that we can add them to the seed list, but at a cost of £300 each variety. Now, we've calculated that we have well over 200 varieties that we would need to add, and that would be a cost of £84,500 mm. for varieties that you can sell, that we can sell and you can buy freely at the moment. It makes no sense. Yeah. There is, that would, is would, not a benefit. Would that, is that just because you are like the, the main and only company really doing this that you no, no, cover no, no. the whole cost or would it be every company that wants to sell these things? E exactly. So when I say specialist seed companies, so 
Frankie, uh, as I said, are the oldest family run seed company in, in the world. Seven generations, still the same family. I mean, it's it's incredible when you think about it. Since 1783, um, the year that Mozart wrote his first mass, the Montgolfier brothers flew their hot air balloon and the famous British um, garden designer, uh, Capability Brown died actually. So, so we're putting it into a garden context, but there are loads of speciality companies. There's chili companies and tomato companies and companies that specialize in in, in in you know just one type of flower or one type of vegetable whatever it might be in fact if you look at the uk and it's it's love affair with um speciality vegetables q gardens the oldest botanical gardens in the world rhs the oldest um horticultural society in the world how many plant hunters you know went off to the americas and and new zealand and australia and you know all over the place hunting plants so we have this great tradition in britain of speciality plants yet Brexit puts that all at risk because actually I could spend 84 and a half thousand pounds putting all my varieties on, then all the other seed companies can sell them for free. Right. Because yeah. they don't have to yeah. pay because mm -hmm. I've registered them. Well, no, none of the seed companies. So actually what's happened is all the seed companies have come together and uh, as a group and we have joined forces, even the big boys, um, because you know, we don't want this to happen. It's not beneficial for biodiversity um, at all. You, you know, you, you want as many plants in the pool as, as, as you can, but to have already lost 94%, we have about 200 varieties from the remaining 6%. And it's really important that we keep those. Yeah, yeah, a sort of precious resource. Yeah, so there's this big yeah. environmental, um, mm. and especially at the moment, you know, with, did you see the David Attenborough program the other day? when you see the last two rhinos and oh it's so sad was, I know. it was yeah. heartbreaking it was yeah. absolutely heartbreaking yeah it is it's, it's tragic yeah so well that yep that's that's interesting and and what about like sort of things like you must be importing most of your seeds how do you see that going with the, the okay. lorries getting so, across the channel and yeah farm filling so I, I love I, I love this preconception so sometimes when we're doing Hampton Court Chelsea Flower Show which you know the best flower shows in the world you know they really are and you couldn't have that you, you know britain has this this wonderful uh culture as i said and and the rhs flower show is the best flower show in the world just like the slow food show in turin is the best food show in the world and you know it's mm. italian food culture and we all do things differently don't we and but but together we, you come together and you get this this lovely pool of 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 knowledge and and ideas and um but there's a problem because when we when we're at RHS um, and someone comes up to us and they say, "Where are your seeds from?" I say Italy, and they say, "Oh, well, I buy British seed." And I said, "Really? Do you?" And I say, "Name me one British seed company," and they reel off all these names, and they're not British. Before World War II in Britain, there were more than forty packet seed companies that produced their own seeds for their own packets, and now there are none. Not one British seed brand produces its own seeds for its own packets. Now that's really surprising. Um, there are some very, so the, the problem with Britain is you get very, very large seed companies, you know, the real big boys, the corporate ones. And then at the other end of the scale, you get these very, very tiny seed companies. Some of them produce their own seeds, like Real Seeds and a couple of others, Stormy Hall and a couple of others, but they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're smaller brands. But in the middle, there's nothing. And so, um yeah it, it, it's a really massive problem that people just make a lot of assumptions about seeds so a lot of seeds come in 75 percent of all the garlic in this country comes from china for example and when you say to people garlic they say isle of white less than one percent of garlic comes from britain if you think about it garlic originated in the far east so it's a bit like me saying mozzarella oh it comes from italy kel surprise um so there is an element of that but actually a lot of seeds come from the far east they come from america the the, the, the biggest seed producers in the world are china india israel egypt kenya zambia america chile australia vietnam and the eu so th these are these are massive problems don't forget as well that our, our, our company is based up in the Alps. So when, when, when people think of Italy, they have this lovely Dolmio um, mm. sort of uh, image of Italy where everyone with dark hair and brown eyes and they all have a mama 
clearly I have a mama. Uh, but they think of, of tomatoes and they think of olive oil. My Italy is cows with bells on. We never eat pasta. I eat more pasta in the UK. Um, you know, we just don't eat pasta in the Alps. We have polenta, we have rice, we have gnocchi because we have potatoes um, and never eat olive oil. We have cows with bells on. We have butter, butter with everything. And so there's these two Italys. There's sort of Alpine Italy and there's, and there's Mediterranean Italy. So what I'm talking about is provenance. And so it's what we were saying before. It's about cheddar from cheddar. It's about the San Marzano tomato from Naples. It's about the, the Costelluto tomato from Parma. There's a little bit of Parma there. And that is literally when you eat it, you're eating it with slices of Parma ham, with shavings of Parmesan cheese. That's real food. In fact, proper food, as we all know, is simple. It's the best ingredients. And I've had too much of it. It's, it's tasty. And that goes for any dish. It could, you know, it could be haggis. It could be, uh, uh, it, it could be Cornish pasties. It could be uh, cassoulet in France. It, it could be anything. Good food is good food. Good food is simple ingredients and, you know, lots of provenance. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I know uh, watching one of your other videos, I heard how like, a lot of the areas of Italy, Italy are quite cold, so they're probably quite good for us Scottish growers, like uh, similar yeah. climate and it, it's really hardy varieties to Bergamo, put up with our gardening where, skills. Yeah. <laughs> Bergamo, where Frankie is based, has exactly the same amount of rainfall to one millimetre of Cardiff, but you can't ski in Cardiff. And right. my family, we come from Piemonte, so we come north of Turin. We have double the amount of rainfall of London. And we get it all in the summer. Mm. And so I'm a glutton for punishment because what happens is I go on holiday from London in August and it rains the entire time I'm there. And so, you know, um, and then, of course, Italy has this very long coastline. So it's amazing. You can have lemons from Naples and then you can have, you know, cold loving vegetables. So things things that you should be sowing now are things like broad beans, uh, fava beans. Uh, you should be sowing those September, October, November. You should be sowing things like when you when you get your your salad bags, you, you see radicchios, which are red chicories. And again, they only turn red with the cold. If you try and grow them in the summer, what happens is they grow green and they become very bitter. And these are wonderful. You, you can. I think we're very scared in Britain to, to cook leaves, but these would be shredded and you can throw them into a risotto, risotto la trevigiana, where you have the, the, the rice, the risotto rice, which is creamy. Then you have the radicchio, which has this pleasant bitterness. Then you have the Italian sausage. You can leave that out if you're vegetarian. Uh, and if you're vegan, just use a, a, you know, a non-meat broth. And you, and you have this pleasant bitterness and, and, the, and the saltiness of the sausage and all three together, it just makes for a wonderful dish. And you're harvesting that outside in January, February. It laughs at the cold. Um, so, you know, very, very interesting varieties. But the thing that you're sowing now, the big thing is garlic. And garlic uh, must have sub-zero. This is why you should never store garlic in your fridge. Because when you do, what happens is, the cloves of the head start to sprout little green shoots because it's, it feels the cold and it says, ah, it's sowing time. And so it tries to sprout. And so um, there's, an old, there's an old saying in Italy, the fridge is the enemy of cheese. And to that, I would add tomatoes because um, if you want to kill the flavor of a tomato, before you serve it, mm -hmm. put it in a fridge. Tomatoes should be served at air temperature. You should pick that tomato. Mm. Your hand smells of the of the the, the plant, and yeah. you should you should serve it warm. You know, tomatoes, cheese, and garlic. Never put them in the fridge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. So I didn't know about the cheese, but I did know about tomatoes. Jenny's got a question. So, um, Jenny, something about the US deal and how that. That might. Yeah, so we've had um, a question in um, just with regard to the US deal. And so we've heard about all these issues about, you know, chlorinated chicken and the beef um, and then, you know, ground up insects, maybe in spices. Is there any similar kind of concerns surrounding seeds maybe from America? Right. So um, I think I've kind of touched on it by by saying, you know, that the same thing with food, that, that um, food standards dropping. Um, and cheaper sort of inferior standard not just foods but also animal welfare as well if you're talking about animals um 
the same thing will happen with seeds. So we're at risk of losing the sort of cheddar from cheddar varieties, you know, the 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 uh, the, the, the amazing sort of Neapolitan basil leaves bigger than your hand. Uh, what else comes from Naples? Buffalo. And so these varieties are always used to wrap mozzarella. You know, these are varieties that have been used for, for generations. These are the varieties that are at risk. And then you're going to get the mass produced varieties, which, you know, um, you'll still be able to buy. And this is this is one of the problems. But I'm but, um, just expanding a little bit on that. There's there's something that British farmers have always called the hunger gap or the hungry gap and so what one of the the problems that we have in the uk is our climate so it's a pro and a con it's a temperate climate so winters are cold but they're not as cold as italy you know you can't ski in the uk you ski in italy uh the summers are warm but they're not too hot you know so so we have this lovely temperate climate which means we can grow a wide range of vegetables but we have one problem and that is february march and april uh, well, March, April and May, really. And that's what British farmers, British farmers have always called the hungry gap or the hunger gap. And so the problem here is that all our British vegetables are running out. Carrots, the, the turnips, the onions, the parsnips, you know, all that, all those, those vegetables that you can harvest late and store. And so we've got this natural two to three month, three month gap where actually um, we have no homegrown or very little homegrown fresh veg. So, so what do we do? We're very reliant on the EU. Um, so if you think France, Italy has a better climate, you know, all those, co all those coastal bits, Naples, Sicily, those bits that are hot, uh, Spain, Portugal, Holland too. Holland has set up to do, um, to grow vegetables. Not only there, we get some veg also from America, we get veg from Morocco and other places. Um, EU's better because of air miles. You know, we don't want to be uh, flying things in. Beans come from Kenya and, and, and uh, Zambia, places like that. But we just physically can't grow them here. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a, a massive problem because the, the problem with fresh veg is the first word, it's fresh. You can't stockpile it. And if lorries are going to be stuck, for whatever reason, you know, at ports, uh, especially at first, whilst there's confusion, there might be some, you know, th th there's going to be, th these are genuine issues. Th these are absolutely real issues that are, are, are going to um, affect us, uh, us all. And I know you can eat tin vegetables, but it's not the same. And no. it, none of us want that, you know, at the end of the day. And so we really don't want to be stuck with all these sort of corporate uh, vegetables a lot, a lot of vegetable seed comes from america um i would much rather have a cheddar from cheddar look it's not about flag waving it's just about doing things properly i want chinese soy sauce i don't want italian soy sauce but i want italian mozzarella yeah, yeah. and i want french brie de mieux and i want spanish manchego so it's 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 not about flag waving it's just about doing things properly and having access to those things that we've always had because actually losing them would be a disaster it, it, how how does it benefit us it's actually mm -hmm. a loss yeah for us yeah i know just being organized i know I, yeah and did we hear that you had your company had done a brexit survival box vegetable survival box can you tell yeah, us so, more so, about that yeah i'll tell you about this so um saturday night We'd had a few grappers, my wife and I, and um, we had an idea to do a Brexit vegetable survival kit. It was a bit of fun. All right. So it, it's actually really well thought out because inside there are 12 varieties, one for each month of the year. To, so there's something to harvest every single month of the year. And the great thing about it is they're all varieties that you can either store or harvest. So you've got so that one you, har you harvest in the winter. Um, there's the mixed salad, which you can harvest for eight months of the year. There's lamb's lettuce, which I was picking last year in my garden, covered, it, it, but not heated, uh, just in a cloche until February. And then you've got things like beans that you can dry for the winter. And spinach, you sow spinach now. It hates the heat. If you sow spinach with heat, it bolts. And so there are things. Kale, which survives right through the winter. Look, many of you grow Cavallo Nero kale. And it's and why, why is it hardy? Because it comes from Tuscany, the Apennine mountain range. You are the Alps and the Dolomites in the north, the Apennines down the middle for a thousand kilometers. And then you've got 
um, three good ski resorts in Sicily. People forget that Italy is an alpine country. And then you've got peas where you can dry peas, you can freeze peas, you can um, bottle uh, beans. And so, you know, pumpkins you can store, tomatoes you can make sauce. So it's re been really well thought out. So just for a laugh, we knocked this thing up. We did the bracket, the um, the uh, stickers, you know, and the, and the packaging. And that was on the Saturday night. And on the Sunday, we did one tweet. I get to work on Monday. I did seven interviews. It just straight away went viral. I did three um, in, uh, TV interviews, German TV, Chinese TV, and uh, I think it was Spanish. And then, and then uh, three or four other sort of magazine, uh, paper, uh, in, you know, journalists rang. And I, I've done dozens of, of uh, interviews on it. And um, apart from the fact it's a really well thought out uh, thing you know we did it just just for fun maybe a bit trolling there but it's been it's been really really successful so um yeah, yeah. It, was, it was completely accidental <laughs> yeah and and i think um somebody had said would would you be able to grow them in a window box would any of them grow yeah so again all the varieties we chose um we chose them because they can be grown in a garden but they can also be grown in either boxes pots or grow bags so if you imagine a grow bag has three holes that's um you tend to grow med veg in 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 uh, in grow bags uh tomatoes peppers aubergines melons cucumbers pumpkins courgettes three so you've got three holes you put three in um and then you know other things like uh, uh bush tomatoes are really good for window boxes and for pots and these are so versatile because you can you can eat them fresh you if it gets late in the winter you can make sauce with them um you can bottle them which means you don't use up your freezer space because freezer space is always limited so again really really well thought out and um they've all been designed so that you can do them either in pots or in uh, or in containers and obviously look we're very lucky in the UK as well because we have allotments and not all countries have allotments, not to the scale that we do. And so even if you live in a flat, you know, you could apply for an allotment and you can share allotments. This is a really cool thing now. You don't have to take, you know, you don't have to think that you're a farmer or anything. You can share an allotment with with another person now. They, they're dividing them. So because there is actually a shortage of allotments. Yeah, they're quite big, aren't they? Yeah. yeah oh, well, I'm yeah. inspired to try again. Growing vegetables. <laughs> so, good. So you've got us all going on that. Um, so just on a, just a few of the sort of political things, have you been following any of the agriculture bills, trade bills? I know there's some decisions coming up. Have you been following that? Or so? Yeah, I, I, not, not so much. I think I think my interest is more in, in uh, I'm more on the haughty side of things than the agricultural yeah. side. But I did go to the um, farmers march. Um, and I, I went down as, as a volunteer with um, with EU Flag Mafia. You may have heard of them, and they, they're, they're kind of really cool. And we went down, and uh, uh, we, we were very, you know, we were welcomed down there. They're, they're a very small organisation uh, with uh, sort of just uh, volunteers who, who help out. And I think they've got a really cool kind of... Um, following you know they do the the the, the proms uh, flags which incidentally it was all about supporting musicians um it, the the flags at the proms the was the first remain event after the advisory referendum it was the first sort of step on the ladder to this massive pro-eu movement we have in the uk now mm -hmm. which is the biggest pro-eu movement in the eu yeah. And so, you know, I, I know the organisers and it's, it's, it's a, you know, people like yourselves and others. Um, but it was all about the musicians. Lots of those musicians at the proms um, are gigging musicians, British. They're going to have to have carnets for their musical instruments. Uh, ask any journalist about carnets, about their camera equipment and that pre-EU. It was a nightmare. Um, I'm ex British Airways as well, so I know all about it. You know the delays at the airport because of that, and so um, you know if you need a a celloist tomorrow night at the Scala because the celloist has got COVID, is sick, you need to get on a plane. You need freedom of movement. Yeah, and this will hurt gigging musicians. I'm a musician, so I am a musician. I play the accordion. Um, uh, uh, Richard Kipling said it best. He said the the um, the definition of a gentleman is a man who who knows how to play the accordion but doesn't. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> there you go. So, but, um, you know, I'm a musician and uh, all, all the team that, that, that were at the proms every year, can I just say, four or five years now, yeah. are, are music lovers and and musicians. And oh, so yeah. it was always in support of that. So, so yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the Brexit thing affects so many, uh, well, it affects every industry and every, you know, the car industry, the food industry. Uh, look at food labelling. The UK has missed the deadline for applying for new food labels. So what the hell are we going to do in January? All our food labels are going to be illegal. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is a massive problem because if if exporters, um, food exporters, if we want to export those wonderful Cornish pasties, amazing we should you know we should be so proud of, of of some of the wonderful products we have in this country if we want to export them to the yeah. eu mm -hmm. and our labeling we've missed the boat because the government yeah. were too late to apply crazy it's and, and massive problems massive. more than ever we're going to need to be exporting which doesn't seem to be the government doesn't seem to be conscious of and the other thing i, I think i know you've mentioned a lot tonight the cornish pasties issue and things and didn't we hear that that um that the negotiating team from the UK was expecting the EU to protect our brands, but they weren't going to protect the yeah. EU brands. I mean, just yeah. crazy to not to, to, to even propose that you that yeah, so, wouldn't so, be mutually doing it. Yeah, so we're talking about the protected food names scheme again. So when you buy yeah. when you buy a food product like Parma ham and it says PDO after, what those three letters means is protected denomination of origin. It means that that food has been produced locally using local animals or vegetables or fruits or whatever it is, or milk for the cheese, whatever it might be, to a registered recipe, just like the Cornish pasta we were talking about before. That's also um, in that scheme. So what they were saying was, we want British products still to be recognised under this EU scheme, but we won't recognise Parma ham. Mm. Local does not mean British. So Parma ham is a great example, as I've just said, of a local food that is produced with passion, with local ingredients. Mm. So is Brie de Mieux, like I said before. So is uh, um, Anglesey sea salt, <laughs> yeah. which is another one. Yeah. The Denby plum has, was the last British product mm -hmm. to be a Welsh to be registered it's an heirloom plum it was almost lost it's been brought back to life by slow food and by mm. people working really hard and they applied and they got pfn um just as it ended. oh one of the last ones oh great yeah i think it was the last british yeah. product and so it had that protection what does this mean it means that now uh the french or the italians or the you know whoever can make english cheddar but it's not English cheddar. It might be inferior. We could make it in Glasgow. We could make it in, you know, and we can call it a Cornish pasty, but it's not, you know, before that, that you weren't allowed to do that because it was protected. So it, it's, it's again, it's not a benefit. It, it opens us up to um, copying and inferior products. So yeah. you think you're eating something yeah. and you're not. Very worrying. Bad for consumers and yeah. Jenny, and it's bad for the industry, you know. It's bad, <coughs> Oops, it's bad for the industry, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, is there any more comments from people online who have been watching? Well, just in terms of, you know, your Brexit survival kit that you were talking about, we're growing our own vegetables. Do you think that people should be stockpiling again? Ah, so, so this is this is really interesting because um, I said before that the um, the virus hit um well, it hit the UK February, March, April, May, but actually we didn't lock down till March the 26th or 23rd, something like that. But seed crops were already in the ground. And so the problem with this is that there was massive over demand, as I said, but we couldn't increase. When I say we, I mean the, the seed industry. I don't mean us uh, as a whole. The seed industry couldn't increase supply because, you know, you can make this paper, you can make this mug, you can make this computer, but you can't make a seed. You have to grow a seed and it's not something that, 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 that you can manufacture. And so I guarantee that there will be food shortages because food comes from seed and there are seed shortages. And so this is flight school 101 stuff. Four and a half years we've been banging on about this, that, uh, you know, if seeds are affected, then food will be affected. And so it will have a massive knock on effect. Already British flour there's a shortage of British flour because wheat harvests were down. So what does that mean? So this is this is irrelevant of Brexit, irrelevant of COVID. 
it means that, that supply and demand prices will go up and availability will go down. What was out of stock in March, April, May? Flour. Mm. So this is going to put all of these things are going to put massive pressure. So COVID, let's let's not beat around the bush. COVID has had a terrible effect. I've got friends with restaurants. They're desperate. They're not making the money they were making before, you know, things like that. Having transition ending in January after being ravaged by COVID is illogical. And, yeah. and it, 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 it's, I have no words. You've heard me all night babbling on, I'm speechless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What yeah. do you say? I know. Jenny, any more? There was a, a did you say there was quite a funny question come in? Um, <clears throat> there's a question about the, um, the EU trading block and um, that the EU block will have no reason to enforce such protections for a country which is no longer a member. So there'll be no deal. And this person thinks that London will survive anyway. What's your opinion on that? Um, what do you mean? So, so just so so London is very metropolitan. Mm -hmm. It's very cosmopolitan. Um, you know, p people have been uh, going home. I know. So oh, let's go back to COVID. Lots of Italian restaurants, for example. I'm, my family are Italian. Uh, I know, and I know a lot of Italian restaurants. Lots of the waiters, the waitresses, um, the uh, the chefs, the front of house, the back of house, the cooks, whatever, have left. They've left because of COVID. A restaurant isn't like an office. A restaurant is a team. And when you break your team up that you've spent years building up, your sous chef, your chef, your pastry chef, your front of house, your back of house, you cannot go down to the job centre and just start again. And on the first day, you're, you're up and running. So th 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 there are big problems here. Restaurants cannot live on the new normal. They're not taking the money. They're having to clean in between. They're having to uh, um, have more spacing, so less covers. They're going to take less money. Some will go bust, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's so sad. Um, and so what we're going to see, we're going to see a knock-on effect from COVID. We're going to see a knock-on effect from, from people. You, you know, last Wednesday, 6,000 people lost their jobs at uh, Premier Inn. There was another 6,000 from somewhere else. I forget who it was now. There was 450 from Weatherspoons. There was a couple of hundred from somewhere else. That was in one day. And that's without looking at Brexit. And so, you know, this is going to hit us long term. You're right. Lond London is very resilient. And, uh, and very innovative and very creative. But if we don't have that framework where we can, where we can trade easily and we can get, you know, when we, when we see a boom uh, area, you know, like ingredients, supermarkets, people selling foods, flowers, all of these seeds, all of these things have actually done really well. Um, but, you know, we, we're going to need staff. If there's no, another thing, working uh, protection, uh, at the moment, if you know, you get paternity leave, you get maternity leave, you get sick pay, you get holiday pay. That's all written in EU law. If we've left the EU and the, that same standard is not kept, you know what? I could take you on, I could take you on, I could take you on, I could take you on and pay you minimum wage, not give you any holidays, whatever. It, it depends what happens. But we're losing some of these protections. We know this already. So, you know, there's lots of areas. Um, Business isn't just about what you sell. It's about how you sell it. It's about the quality and the provenance. You know, there are some who sell you know, mass produced stuff and there are other specialists. There's, that's why I love the high street so much. You know, you go to a big supermarket. It's completely different to going to a, a cheese shop. And, you know, you speak to the person in the cheese shop and they tell you the story of this cheese and that cheese and, and where it comes from and how it's eaten. And you get that personal service with restaurants as well. And that's what we're really good at in, in, in um, you know, the small business is the backbone of this country. Small businesses like myself, SMEs, we, we hire people, we hire local people. I always say to, to, to the people here, you don't work for us, you work with us, you know? And it's true. And, and uh, yeah. it's, there are just so many areas where where we, we're all going to be affected. And uh, my passion is food. My passion is seeds. And so, so you know, 
that's what I, you know, really care about and, and really passionate about. And I'm really worried that, that we, we're going to take a backward step. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't really know where we're going. And um, so just going back to the gardening, did, did you say there's another question there, Jenny, just from on a... Oh, that's... So, actually, I've got it here. So... <laughs> Just to finish, see if Paolo can answer this one. So this comes from Alison in our group um, who lives in Glasgow. She says, we have a small raised bed in a south facing garden, but it's actually in the shade uh, much of the time because of a block of flats. Okay. So sheltered garden gets morning and evening sun, about 20 square feet. And she's wondering spinach or kale, what, you know, what Fantastic. would be good to buy? Fantastic, spot on. <laughs> so what you want to, to do is um, there is a plant for every single uh, condition, okay? But what you want to avoid in a situation like that is medveg. So you avoid the, the big tomatoes especially. You could probably do cherry tomatoes, but I would say avoid medveg, tomatoes, peppers, aubergines, melons, even cucumbers. And do leafy crops, you know, do things like the cut and come again lettuces, where one of these makes 40 or 50 of those bags you buy in the supermarkets, and you're going to stagger that sowing. You do a pinch every month. When you go to the supermarket, you don't buy 40 salad bags, you know, because they, they would go off. So you stagger the sowing. Do things like little round carrots. This is an endangered variety, and uh, it, it's, it's from Paris. Paris is built on clay. So, you know, you can only hit your head against a brick wall so many times before you adapt. And over the generations, this carrot has adapted. So it, 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 it's fine with half sun, let's say. Things like winter vegetables, things like spinach, things like chard. Swiss chard is lovely. Very underrated vegetable in the UK. It's used a lot more in Germany, in France, in Italy and countries like that. And it's actually related to beetroot. So you, you, you get... Um, they're from the same family. So you get these wonderful leaves, uh, which don't bolt like when spinach does. Uh, they'll bolt later. And you get a crop in the spring and then it, re it reanimates itself and you get another crop in the autumn for no, uh, you know, no extra money, if you like. Then you get these wonderful stalks, which you can parboil and then you just pan fry with butter, not with olive oil, with a fried egg, with a bit of grated parmesan or a good cheddar on top and a hunk of bread and a glass of wine. And you've got an amazing meal that you've just cooked. And, and it's related to beetroot. And that's why you get these red chards and um, uh you should avoid eating beetroot actually if you are um, diabetic because it, it has a very very high sugar content um, but uh, great for making beetroot burgers uh, which I absolutely adore I'm not a vegan I would call myself flexitarian I eat everything but I love I love vegan um, beetroot burgers they're a new discovery for me and they're just delicious in their own right um, yeah, so that's what I would do is just sow those those leafy um, vegetables mm. and forget the med, med veg. But okay. do garlic at this time of year, garlic yeah, and raw yeah. beans. Yeah. Ah, oh, brilliant. Okay, Alison, you're listening. We're, we're looking forward to seeing your garden in a few months' time. That's great. So, yeah, that's been really good tonight. Um, covered lots of topics and inspired us all also to get out in the garden. So thank you very much, Paolo. Jenny, all I was going to say was just as a as a sort of a last um, a last thing, I'll just pop you over a, a, a quick email um, and I'll, I'll give you our, our contact details and, and we'll do like um, for for the rest of this week, we'll do like a, a remainer discount. Uh, so I'll give you like a discount code or I'll give you details of how to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll email you in a in an hour or so. So so people have listened okay, to, the, uh, to the to the to the evening if they want something you know, we'll, we'll, or we'll throw in an extra packet or something. We'll, we'll, we'll do something. Yeah. Um, but just by way of, of a thank you, but you know, it's, it's really good uh, to grow your own vegetables if you can. And uh, you know, there's no downside to it. And, and, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And actually by growing these old varieties, these heritage varieties, you're actually supporting biodiversity, you know, much yeah. better to do that than to grow, I don't know, gardener's delight, which has a thousand um, producers and that has two. Yeah, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Oh, that's brilliant. Good. Okay, thank you very much. We'll put that onto our Facebook and Twitter pages, and I'll do it anybody. Right now. Yep. Thank you to Paolo from Seeds of Italy, and uh, okay. Good night, everybody that's been watching. Thank you. Buonanotte.